So we're gonna start the program with a little bit of, before I introduce Carol, with a little bit of housekeeping. So um, um, I'm just gonna ask you that you mute. Um, you are on mute, but we welcome your questions and look forward to them. So please have a piece of paper and pencil next to you so that we can um, take your questions. You're gonna submit all your questions through Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Now, some of you may be using a tablet, and on the tablet, the Q&A is at the top of the screen. So just um, note where your Q&A is and, and uh, type in your questions as, as they come. Um, we at Riverwoods and all our presenters are always looking for your feedback. We welcome it. We wanna be the best for you. We wanna improve. So if there's something that we missed today or something that you'd like us to present to you, please let us know. We will welcome those. And if you also have a, a, a topic for the future, we will welcome that too. So right now you're looking at um, our three communities and I love to tell the story our, how we revolutionized retirement. Um, two visionary women, Marianna Hatch and Rosemary Coffin, both of Exeter, gathered a group of Seacoast residents around a table and their goal was to create a community where active adults were engaged and can enjoy their lives among friends, make new friends, but also have, I call it the security blanket of long-term care. So in 1994, the, the uh, community to the left, Exeter opened up and the concept proved popular. People wanted to know, they came, they looked and they were eager to learn more. So um, in 2012, we grew. Our mission was to provide this lifestyle, was to, uh, to uh, as many people as possible, and we wanted to fulfill that mission. So we have three campuses here in Exeter, um, the, the Woods, the Ridge, and the Boulders. And then we acquired in 2012, Riverwoods Manchester. And then our uh, community in Durham opened up two years ago um, with 150 units. And um, so three, three wonderful, um, self-contained, independent living, um, continuing care retirement communities. So that's our family. So for those of you that might hear CCRC and not sure what that is, we are a continuing care retirement community. And I always tell people once you've gone to one, you've gone to one. So I suggest that when you're starting to do your homework to um, do your diligence and really make sure you understand the contracts. They're all a little bit different. We are a not-for-profit continuing care retirement community. Other than growing to fulfill our mission, we have maintained the same model. We uh, are type A where the contracts, uh, you, you, you come in, independently, that is the requirement. And once you are uh, financially and medically qualified, then we provide long-term care for you in our healthcare centers, which includes assisted living, nursing care, and memory care. And a portion of your monthly, of your entrance fee is um, also tax deductible. So you'll be informed of that and of course, our standard contract is 90% of your entrance fee would go back to your state. So it's a state preservation while having, again, the security blanket, uh, a very predictable contract where you know your costs are not going to increase by a lot as you transition to healthcare. So you live independently. I hear often every day people say, I've met the best friends of my life since coming here. So whether you're a single or a couple, people mix, mingle, and munch among themselves, make new friends. All of your maintenance is taken care of. If you're no longer able to drive, we will take you the places that you need to go. We have a wide range of programs, educational programs, social programs. I think we have 40 or 50 different committees and still growing. So we welcome ideas for new committees. Um, but the most important thing is you are in control of your life. So your planners, and most people that come to continuing care retirement communities are people that are planners, people that have planned their lives before, their jobs, their homes, their families. Well, this is a way to plan for your next chapter. So I'm gonna turn it over to our, our guest speaker now, um, Carol Merritt. And Carol spent nearly a decade helping her parents with aging issues. Carol was given a wake up call, who will do all of these things for me? Um, that I did for my parents. Taking a note of that hard truth, 
she got on the stick and created a roadmap to guide her to address the inevitable challenges of aging alone. She has presented and taught hundreds of adults how to think about and take action for acquiring stronger purpose, more engagement, safe and secure finances, legal concerns, and more. She's the go-to authority for the largest adult population, solar ages. And our book, if you have it there, I have it here with me and I frequently open it up. So welcome, Carol, um, and thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you, Diane. I appreciate it very much. And thank you to River, Riverwoods Group for inviting me this afternoon to give you my presentation on the roadmap for a supportive and secure future. And it's actually a book that I wrote, which you see behind me, which is available on Amazon. And it, this book and this roadmap really was designed from my own plan after helping both my parents. So a little bit about that. This is a picture of my family and of course me uh, with my siblings. And this, these are the activities and some of the care issues that my parents required uh, from both, well, from all three of my, uh, well, two of my sisters. So there were three loving daughters who helped them out. Uh, my brother, unfortunately, was uh, out of, you know, he lived in New Jersey at the time and my parents were, you know, was in, they were in Texas. So he was unable to really pitch in. So mom and dad relied on the three of us and my dad was determined not to be cared for by strangers. <laughs> that was his motto. Uh, but you know, that's, he was from the silent, uh, I guess the, the war generation or the silent generation, one of the older generations. And that's just the way he was raised. He was a farmer and uh, they, they, my parents took care of my grandparents and that's just the way it was. So, so after experiencing all of the, uh, the issues that my sisters and I helped my parents with, that's when I really realized, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Because I have no one to rely on to help me with a few of these, well, any of these issues. Uh, and just, uh, just a note here that this was published back in, well, last month in September. Uh, 14th on Washington Post, it talked about how we're losing personal caregiver assistance uh, for in-home care. And many seniors are now having to rely on each other or if they stay at home, you know, on each other or with their neighbors or friends because um, home care workers are shrinking. Uh, that's just a note that I thought I'd pass along. Uh, so how I started with my own uh, roadmap, so to speak, is I looked at the top issues that my parents really had the most problems with. And I started with health, faith and spirituality, purpose, social connections, support, location, exercise and fitness, transportation, finances and legal matters, and then housing. And um, so I created a living well assessment and I did that for myself because I, I knew that I needed to evaluate my satisfaction on each of these issues or what I call life domains. Because if I didn't know where I fell short, which ones were my weakest uh, domains, then I would have no clue on how to, or which ones needed my work, my attention, uh, my best of my abilities to rectify and manage them and hopefully make them better if they were, uh, if I was failing in them. And then which really gave me more control of my life and it helped me feel more empowered. So these are a few of the steps at the Living Well Assessment that, you know, uh, I'll walk you through today. Uh, you evaluate and measure your satisfaction for each of these, identify which one puts you at risk, and review and create practices to improve them, and research for options and solutions, and then develop steps and things that help you move forward, help you, help you make your life better in, the, in whichever aspect you're failing in or feel least satisfied with. 
So it's a roadmap that uh, really helps you decide and get clarity on where you are right now and then helps you determine where do I want to be? Because you can't go from where you want to be if you don't know where you're starting out. So then, then I give you a strategy of how will I get there. Okay, so let's get started. And in the book, uh, unfortunately today in this presentation, we won't have time to go through all 25 questions per all domains. However, I've selected five per a few of the domains just to give you a quick uh, idea or an idea of, of how you can start looking at your life and your aging process from the, from the uh, standpoint of where you are right now. And if you happen to have a pad and pen, uh, well, first off, I just want to say, don't worry about it if you don't, if you're not prepared to take notes, because uh, I think uh, Riverwoods will send you a, a link next week so you can download it. I have it on my uh, on one of my websites. So, however, if you just want to take quick notes, I, I absolutely encourage you to do so. So I'm going to start with health, which is one of our top concerns. And the way you start looking at your health and start thinking about it, because what was frustrating to me when I was helping both my parents is how do I assess my parents' health? Now, I know I'm not a doctor and, and most medical and healthcare workers would prefer I don't assess my health. However, as a human being, taking care of myself and getting older, I really need to know, well, what are some of the ways that I can become more responsible and have more uh, control of, of how I feel about my health? Well, first of all, do you know your family medical history? So that would be one of the top ways. You know, and, and I know genetics isn't the only thing that affects our health. However, it's a great starting point because if I reflect back on my, my mom and my dad's physical health and my, their mental health, it'll give me kind of a good idea what is the general makeup of my own genetics. And, we'll help, and then once I know that, I'll know where I need to kind of focus my attention. If it's diabetes, if it's arthritis, then what are some of the practices I can put in place that would rectify or at least start to manage them so they wouldn't get too bad as I get older? Uh, what about your body weight? Do you control your body weight? How about uh, chronic illnesses? Do you know how many you have and how well do you manage them? So as you're going through an assessment, when, if, if and when you ever uh, download that, uh, that little uh, special report that, I, that you will have, your, have access to, then, or if you buy my book and go through this assessment yourself, it'll give you, uh, you'll be able to go through each question and then, uh, and then really, uh, uh, I guess, uh, write down your answer so you can get a clear idea of where, uh, where you fall short in terms of, uh, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. I'm not going to try to do it now. But another thing to measure your health is like your blood test. Are you satisfied with your blood test and your medical screenings? And if you're not, discuss with your doctor and your healthcare team how you can make it better how you can make your, say, blood, your blood sugar uh, test or results better. And what about your diet and nutrition? For me, uh, I'm, when I met with my doctor to get a clear health care plan about where I was falling short in my health, we put together a, a diet and um, a healthy diet uh, along with a dietitian. And for me, eating more fruits and vegetables were better for my body than, than other types of foods. So that's one way that you can start looking at your health and how you can make it better. And then your housing conditions, uh, does it support a healthy lifestyle? Are you able to get outside and walk around? And does it promote fitness and engagement right where you live? You know, your home, does it, it, does it support engagement? And if it doesn't, how can you make that better? 
perhaps it's moving to uh, a to river wood, river woods to one of their communities. That way you have instant access to lots of people and lots of social engagement. Uh, is your home affordable? Is it too big? Can you maintain the house? How about the landscaping? Does it require too much of your attention? And will the home grow with you in terms of uh, will, will it allow you to age safely and independently if you stay there? Uh, and what about your monthly budget? Does your home monthly budget you know, meet your uh, your monthly income, your social security and your retirement funds? And is it a safe neighborhood? Uh, do you feel safe where you, where you live? What's the crime rate like? Uh, social connections is, is really important as we grow older because we need daily interaction. So how healthy are your friendships? Uh, the quantity and the quality, it's more about quality rather than quantity. And you know, do you is, are the, are you surrounded by people you can rely on and even uh, share some of the problems that you may be encountering? It could be a healthcare problem, it could be a money issue, what have you. We need people around us to discuss these types of concerns. Uh, and do you have activities, and and do you include friends in these activities? Uh, what about reciprocity? Are your friendships, is it, a, is it a good even give and take? And is it well balanced? And are your friends there for each other? Uh, that's, that's a key in, in friendships. And how strong is your friend network? Uh, does the community where you live offer opportunities to meet new people and meet peers? Uh, your support network, how accessible or easily can, can you help each other out? Uh, because uh, I don't know about you, but I'm aging alone. Uh, I, that's why I live in a high rise and I made a conscious decision to do so because I wanted to be surrounded by people because I'm alone. I have no family, I have no spouse, partner or children. And I was terribly isolated and felt very lonely when I lived in, um, in the suburbs. Um, and then another thing about your support network, uh, if you have a strong peer network for like checking calls, like with my friends and I, we are in, con well, not constant contact, but, but we text each other uh, just to check in, just to make sure that we're okay. As a matter of fact, my friend down the hall was, was uh, pretty sick this last week and she stayed in of course, but uh, at times she needed some help, you know, grocery shopping. So we were able to provide that support for her. Uh, and then what about people? Can you, are, do, are you surrounded by people you can rely on? And, uh, you know, I run a Facebook, an elder orphan Facebook group, and there are so many members who are so alone. They have no one to rely on. And it breaks my heart that, that we, we, that we come to a, a point in our lives where we, we haven't planned and we don't consider some of these obstacles that we will face. And um, so make sure you're around people that you, can, that you can rely on, they're trustworthy, you trust them, you've known them for a while and, uh, and that you know you can count on them. Uh, so do you have a lot of invitations? Uh, to stay engaged? And do you have a strong base of peers, you know, where you can uh, share uh, problems and worries with? So a good way to look at your financial matters is um, how strong are your emergency funds? How strong is your debt and credit score, your retirement savings, your assets, your checking and savings account? Now, of course, I am not a financial advisor, nor would I ever go there. However, but there are ways that you can assess your financial security uh, yourself. And these are five of the ways uh, that you can do it pretty quickly. Uh, your legal matters. This is very important, especially if you don't have nearby family. 
Uh, do you have a state planning in place? What about your health and financial directives? And it seems I'm asked all the time by um, my friends, people in my Facebook group, even online and LinkedIn through my own work, I'm asked about, well, how do I, how do I decide who my healthcare proxy should be? Because it's so important to have someone you trust to be in that position. And do you trust that they will follow your wishes? Uh, that is so significant. Uh, and then do you have your legal doctor? legal documents in order? And have you made end of life decisions? And uh, do you have copies of important contacts like your doctors and CPA, your financial advisor, uh, banks, mortgage company, if you have a mortgage or uh, your retirement accounts, do you have all that documented? And do, does your financial a uh, proxy or decision maker or agent, whatever you want to call that person, are they aware of where these uh, copies are? Uh, so they have quick access if you ever fall into some sort of situation where you can't uh, take care of yourself. So once you go through that, that assessment, now remember you're doing 10 life domain assessments and you're asking 25 questions. However, I'm just walking you through a quick uh, overview of how to start looking at your life. Um, so once you start, once you do an assessment and, and really figure out where you fall short, which of those domains you are the weakest in, or you're the least satisfied in, and I'll show you in a second where I was, how my assessment turned out and where I was least satisfied. And then you start looking at the different skills and knowledge and competencies, mostly skills. What do I need to do to, uh, to have more money? What do I need to do to improve my healthy diet? So you start asking yourself some uh, thought provoking questions that really help you look at possibilities and opportunities and look for solutions. So instead of focusing on the problem and where you fall short and what your weaknesses are, instead you take that, that um, where you fall short, let's say it's money, for example, because that's where I was falling short. Then I started looking at different ways. Well, how can I save more money? How can I make more money? How can I create a budget that really agrees with my, uh, my own income, my month to month income? So you start asking some of these really thought provoking questions. Uh, and then what you do once you go through the assessment, you're going to tally. Uh, to figure out which, which aspect you fall, <clears throat> you know, you are least satisfied with. And so I just give a quick worksheet on how to add all that up. Because once you know which is your weakest one, then that's where you start focusing your attention to start making it better and managing it, finding solutions, finding ways to increase your satisfaction on that particular domain or aspect of your life. Now, this was my assessment. This was how I, once I looked at my whole life, and this was over 10 years ago when I did this, as you can see, money was my weakest point. And then came where I lived, because remember I told you I lived in the suburbs and I felt terribly isolated. I had very few friends. And it required me to, in order to be engaged with people and to have more activities, I had to drive everywhere and drive 10 miles just to meet with people. Now, I know 10 miles is no big, no big deal. However, I don't like driving. I hate driving. <laughs> and maybe you love driving, which is fabulous. Uh, but uh, I didn't care for it. I, would, I wanted support and I wanted friendships right outside my door. I did not wanna to have to spend too much time or, or be too stressed 
to have more activity and friendships in my life. So the location for me was important. Now you may be satisfied right where you are. And that's totally, this is totally uh, uh, coming from our own personal perspectives. I'm not gonna tell you how to live and you can't tell me how to live because we all have our preferences. But from my preference of how I wanted to age, I wanted to be in that kind of location. I wanted more friends. I needed more support because I was living alone. And I often thought, would anyone even notice if I had fallen in my home and they didn't see me walk outside my door? Would they even know, would they even recognize that, hmm, I haven't seen Carol for a day or half a day or what have you. And that was a big concern for me because my mom had fallen and broken her hip. And had my dad not been there and my sister lived just a few blocks away, then I, I hate to even think how, what would have happened to her. So we have to start thinking about these, these concerns and, and, and about these potential risks that we could face. Hopefully we don't have to face them, but we still have to uh, you know, think about them. So this is, uh, uh, this is what I call, this is the same thing that we just looked at here, but this is something I developed for uh, the audience to uh, the readers in my book and even uh, for you, for example, to really track after you do your complete assessment it allows you to draw, like I did with mine, to draw where you, and, and because it gives you a, a, a physical uh, image. And then I kept it in, in front of me and actually in my home, in, at, in my office, so that it was a constant reminder. Now this is, you know, okay, I've got to work on my money issues. How am I going to do that? So I focused my attention there. So that's what this, uh, aging well circle is what I call this. It's kind of a reminder for you. If you have this sitting in front of you or pinned to your refrigerator or wherever, then it kind of is a gentle reminder. Okay, that's where I'm falling short. I need to work on that. And, and I'm not saying that you have to go uh, full effort into making changes. But just having gentle reminders, because it starts to open your mind into, well, you know, even if you're driving down the street or walking down the street, I, I, would, I would start thinking about, well, how can I cut back on my expenses? And it's just a gentle way of making changes. Um, so I, I just recommend people keeping this in front of them um, at all times to give you to give yourself a reminder. Uh, the, and then there are other worksheets like um, looking at another reminder, for example, okay, my first top domain risk was money. And then it was uh, location. And the third one was having more friends in my life. Those were my top three. Uh, another way that you can start evaluating and listing uh, how to start uh, uh, kind of approaching it as a life plan is to determine what are your priorities and list what it is you want or hope to have and what are the options. It helps you start looking for options either through research, through calling uh, uh, nonprofit organizations, possibly going to the library, and just start to do your own research on how you can rectify some of these uh, uh, options, or not rectify, but to find more and better solutions. And then, so you have a list of what are the options, and, and have you missed anything? And I really highly recommend if you plan to start looking at these issues, uh, and then work with people, work with uh, people in terms of a friend, have an accountability partner to help you, to help each other, because this isn't uh, necessarily difficult to do. 
However, it's more fun if you have a partner to do these things with. Another way of listing your issues is uh, what, for example, with my money, I said, what aspects of my money are working for me? So I listed things like, well, I was making an income. Uh, I was on the verge of a few years going on Social Security. So I knew that would be working for me. I knew that at the time my home was paid for. So that was working for me. So I, because you don't want to see everything as a problem. And I didn't want to look at money as being, well, it's, it's so big and it's all a problem and it's awful. I have to look for some of the things that were working for me with my money. And then I was able to kind of, okay, well, that's good. I've got some things working. However, what's not working with my money? Well, my retirement account was almost nil. So I needed to have more savings, uh, a bigger IRA account, and other things that would help kind of uh, to have a, um, a nest egg, to build a nest egg. And also to build my emergency fund to have more, uh, to, uh, I had my debt was okay, but uh, you know, to, we need to lower our debt and then of course, increase our credit, right? So, uh, the, so those are some of the things that weren't working for me. So this is another way of kind of looking at what's working and what's not working on each of the domains. Other questions that you can, you can ask yourself is, uh, uh, what does a good life look like, for example? And, uh, you know, because if you don't know what a good life looks like to you, then you're not going to be able to make, you know, we can't make changes or make it better. So what I liked asking myself is what could happen that would enable me for example, to have more friends, to help me feel more fully engaged and energized about having friendships. So it's just a way of kind of shifting your mind from seeing problems to seeing possibilities. And uh, so what you're, what you're discovering really are your sweet spots. So your best options lie between what it is uh, what it is that you want and the why you want it. For example, for me, I'm going to take one of them. I wanted more engagement and connection with people right where I lived. That's what I wanted. Why did I want it? Because I was isolated, lonely, and had few connections. Well, my sweet spot was, well, where can I put myself where there are people? And that would help me increase my engagement and increase my accessibility to having more peers around me. And for me, that was living in a high rise community. And which is a great example would be a, uh, an independent living community, much like Riverwoods, for example. So this is kind of a, this is a picture of my results. After working my plan, I applied lots of research and did uh, quite a bit of assessment, thinking about how can I make these improvements? And I know you may be thinking, my gosh, that sounds like a lot of work, and it is. However, it's worth the effort because I don't know about you if you've ever helped with uh, parents or helped with older relatives or maybe even a friend or even maybe someone younger than you, but it's a lot of work to grow old and to have people and, well, and have the kind of help that you need. So I figured if I could do much of the work up front, then I am really lessening my risk as I get older. So now after working my plan, I have, I'm, I'm feeling very supported that my money supports me. 
I live in an urban lifestyle, so I'm able to walk my errands or most of them. I'm eating mostly fruits and vegetables, which is a, but sometimes I cheat and have chocolate and other, other things I shouldn't eat, like sugar. <laughs> but we won't talk about that. Uh, but primarily, I really focus on eating healthy foods, which in turn helps my health get better and better. And then my, if you see at the bottom right, that's where I live. That's the high rise that I live in, uh, which we're kind of surrounded in a community of high rises and uh, which, which really uh, meets my needs very well. So I am, uh, this is the, if you can see the link here, uh, you don't have to register for it today. I think uh, Riverwoods will be sending this link out to you, but it is, it's a special report, which kind of walks you through the same strategy my presentation talked about. And then you can download it, uh, at, it's for free and you can start working this. I highly recommend getting a friend uh, or an accountability partner. To, uh, to do it with. I think that's great, Carol. And I, having done some of the work myself, um, I really appreciate your um, validating having an accountability person because we all have the greatest <laughs> um, attempts at things and then for somehow we get distracted. Um, but I think having someone to hold you accountable um, is, a, is, is great, great advice. I also am pleased to know that you eat chocolate once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Way too much, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. So this is a time we've got um, uh, a comment, feedback from an attendee saying, thank you very much for the presentation. It was excellent and helpful. Um, it doesn't look like we have <clears throat> any other questions. Let's see. This is a great time for all of you out there to ask questions. Um, <clears throat> so type them in our Q&A. We, we want to be able to answer them. We'll wait a few minutes and see if we get some sure. more questions. So let's see. Um, OK, we've got a question from someone saying, what's the benefit of a solar ager to move into a CCRC? Continuing care retirement community. Well, I think it's it's the absolute benefit if you um, because first off, like for me, I'm living alone. I have, you'll have instant access to people. Not only that, you have instant access to activities that will keep you, uh, of course, active, healthy, strong, and. Um, and then you have a community where you're actually, you know, that is help that's with you ev through every stage as you age. So you don't have to worry about, well, am I going to be able to find a personal caregiver to come into my home? Uh, will I be able to uh, take that medical test like a colonoscopy because I can't drive myself? You have all of these built in advantages. Uh, that a CCRC, you know, has, has for you. Yeah, I think you're fully supported. I think to follow up with you, Carol, having been here over 15 years, I see people, many, many uh, people coming in alone and even not, but there's a vulnerability when we are alone or, or doing Absolutely. something different. And so um, the benefit is that you're embraced and supported and it is an instant community, similar to what you did in your own life. And so happy that that worked out. It sounds like you have a wonderful community. Um, one of the questions that came up is, what, what is the most common area you get questions about? Is there an area that people typically ask you questions about? Yes, yeah, social connections. That seems to be yeah. the downfall or the least satisfying uh, domain that we all have because when we get older, many times we uh, exit our career, right? We don't have a job. 
Right. And it seems that our career or our job is is where we make a lot of friends. Right. That's Plus, right. it gets you out of the house. Right. But when you retire, you stay home. Um, and it's friendships is where so many people. As a matter of fact, today I, I received an email from someone. She said, I have to have, uh, uh, it, it was some medical treatment. It wasn't a colonoscopy. It was another one. She said, I don't have any friends that will take me. What do I do? And I hear that all the time. And if you have a friend, mm -hmm. then you, you know that you can rely on each other and you do things for each other. And you don't have to have a lot of friends, mm -hmm. just one or two friends that you can count on to help you figure these things out. That's, yeah, that's right. Whether you're living in a CCRC or living in a high rise, <clears throat> to yes. have that support around the bend is, yes. is so comforting. It, it, it takes away some anxiety that all of us have as we're, we're getting older and alone and mm -hmm. not alone, but alone, you know. Um, was your high rise specifically for seniors or is it um, all no. ages, Carol? In it's the, all yeah. ages, all right. ages. However, I would say 50% of us are uh, at least 55 and older. Got, got it, okay. Um, how, you know, someone's asking, where were you, how old were you when you started actively doing this assessment for yourself? You don't have to offer your age, but maybe oh, you did absolutely. it at a certain I point in retirement, you know. It doesn't bother me. Yeah. I, I'll tell yeah. you, I started when I was 55 okay, and I great. feel so, uh, blessed that I, that are, or that I was smart enough to wake up or, or I listened, right? I, I felt like I, I, you know, when I heard that voice in me, what am I gonna do? I mean, it was like, oh my gosh. I guess it's because my parents needed our help so much mm -hmm. that it, it, at 55, I thought, oh my gosh, what am I gonna, and it was, believe me, it was more than, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? <laughs> it terrified me. Um, so I was 55 yeah, I, and it took about seven years to work mm -hmm. through my plan mm -hmm. and to put myself in and get myself in a position where I am today. I mean, I think that's great. And I'm going to follow up with saying, I don't think it's ever too early to plan for our no. next chapter because we all know the fragility of life. I mean, we hear here, I interview people who say, you know, I get up, my husband passed away or my wife passed away suddenly. So planning, have a plan uh, is very comforting um, and it doesn't matter. I th it's never too early because we, a life is full of chapters and we have to plan for those next chapters. It's, it's, it's not, it continues to change. So, yes. and I think nowadays I'm hearing from people and then I'll go back that with social media and COVID that people became isolated and it was more of a challenge to engage people in their lives. So really doing that homework that you provide in the book and looking where you fall short in your life is a wonderful, wonderful exercise. And um, which leads me to another question. Someone asked, where besides Amazon can they find your book? Uh, that's it. It's on Amazon. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. There are a couple of questions about how do I find an executor? I mean, I, you, I'll let you answer that, Carol. Um, you know, um, yes. And it, how do you find an executive? Executive, well, if, yeah. if you don't have people that like family or people you rely on and you trust, I mean, that's an important factor to have or character to have in your uh, executor, then I would uh, talk with an elder law attorney about it or a financial fiduciary and, um, and they can help you figure that out. Okay. Um... Let's see. Um, very much want to say thank you as I'm not quite old enough for Riverwoods. However, I can relate so much as I'm in the same situation with my parents and it has dramatically affected how I am looking at the future. And thank you for validating my concerns and wanting to make good decisions for the older me. Thank you. Wonderful feedback. Another wonderful presentation. Thank you. Another one, you are absolutely right, just to drive to just to drive to cataract surgery and help with drops becomes an obstacle. The suburbs and retirement can be very isolating. Another yes, one, 
I feel that it will be a challenge to live in that kind of environment after living alone in a large house for decades. Um, what are some of this? This is probably for me. What are some of the suggestions for finding a comfortable balance between privacy and community? And I'll answer this on behalf of, of Riverwoods and Carol. You can kind of say, I mean, we have people here that have left huge houses and say, I'm so thrilled to be surrounded by some of the most wonderful, my favorite pieces. I'm in a smaller space. I have neighbors that I can relate to. I can be in a library quiet or I can be in the dining room social. So there are no rules or regulations. It's all, change is always hard and there's always some resistance, but not planning for that change is the worst thing that you can do for yourself. So understand that it is not easy. I'm sure Carol might've had some challenges moving into a building unknown. You can share a little bit about that, you know, That's leaving the suburb. That's right. Those, I call those unintended consequences, those things we don't think about. And I can tell you one right now is I have, when I say I have neighbors all around, believe me, I have neighbors all around. <laughs> and yeah. sometimes I hear them through my walls. So that is an unintended consequence that I didn't particularly care for. Another thing I don't like is, um, because I'm a, I'm a very private person. And how it, so what people are always wanting to do something or uh, I, I, we don't knock on each other's door, thank heavens. I appreciate that very much. Um, but it, you know, sometimes people just want to get into your business. And uh, so I have to, I had to learn really strong boundaries, uh, which was, which was hard for me because I'm, I'm a, such an easy go lucky kind of person, but I have learned that. So now I have, um, and because I work from home out of my uh, condo, you know, people think, well, she's, she can go and do things or she can take me to the doctor or she can go and do this. And it's like, no, I really have a schedule. <laughs> So, so anyway, there, there are ups and there are downs, negatives and pros, right? Pros and cons of for wherever we live. Right. It just depends on where you feel most safe, mm -hmm. where you have the most activity, where you have connections, where you feel engaged. Do you, do you feel fulfilled? Are you feeling satisfied? All those things uh, is what we need to look at. That, that's wonderful. Another great feedback. My mom, now 93 and no longer driving, as of this past summer, has been in a CCRC in Florida for 10 years. I would echo what Carol and Diane have said, but can you include the peace of mind for the kids to know that while we are in Chicago, Detroit, and Boston, she is safe and cared for and lives among friends. Amen. Thank you, Ellen. That's great feedback. Yes. Um, so let me just kind of scroll through. Someone's asking about um, uh, how do I know if I afford Riverwoods? That would be something that you would make an appointment. We would talk to you about it. Um, so let me just see what else. Um, uh, okay, let me just see. Do you ever feel overwhelmed with all your preparations for aging? How did you deal with the huge number of needs, details, research? of making changes, it's a massive undertaking. You know, I, that's why I'm a big promoter of start early and start way before you are starting to face some of the risk, like bad health, uh, more chronic illnesses. You know, start as soon as you can. Start before you have emergencies happen, before your health goes south, before, before you start worrying too much, you know, tackle it now because I cannot even imagine doing this when I'm 75 or 80. It would, it, I, I would have just been blown away. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, yeah, absolutely. And we tell that again <laughs> to people as they're thinking about downsizing how overwhelming that can be oh my gosh um, yeah you know, i mean that's that's a big you know start early start now one of the questions i got do you find that you're you reassess your domains every few years 
Absolutely. As your life changes. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But the good news is because you have created a plan, then it's so much easier to use the same roadmap and, and to just kind of pivot and make changes wherever mm -hmm. you need to make a change. So it's a lot easier. Plus, you've done it before. So it's kind of like learning a new habit. Oh, well, I know how to do that. Okay. So now I'm starting to have higher blood sugar. Oh, okay. So what does that mean? I, I'm on the I'm at the risk of having diabetes. So how do how can I rectify that? Mm -hmm. And uh, so you just follow the steps again. Yeah. Off with your doctor, create a care plan around it. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that all of us agers have to do is be adaptable and be open. I think one of that's one of the things because we, we do a change is again, comes to us in different ways, whether it's health, whether it's lifestyle, whether it's companionship, whatever it is, it happens, you know, so we just have to recognize that, you know, things will change and be prepared for it. And I think once again, your book, it's, it's a very, I found it to be just very comforting. I'm also a solar ager. And I, I just loved reading about the ways, the great ways that we can connect when we're no longer working full time and so many wonderful volunteer opportunities. Um, the wisdom of aging people is so welcome in, in communities now. Yeah. So um, really wonderful, very hopeful, um, hopeful thoughts. Let me just scroll through and make sure I got all the questions. I also, um, let's see, um, uh, lots of thank yous, Carol. Um, thank Good. you, a common thank sense you. approach. I am part of a woman in transition group that I plan to bring the book in for discussion. We have okay. covered many of these topics while we were working and now 18 year, late, years later, here we are and time for reassessment because it now is real. Again, the, the, the fact of a changing, you know, in 18 years, a lot changes, you know. Um, so lots of thank yous. Uh, the gift, this gift will be a great gift for friends who haven't started planning for their future. I worry for my friends who out of fear or other reasons don't want to tackle this important topic. Um, so great, great uh, feedback from people. Um, and, um, Yes, just don't bury your head in the sand. I know too many people that just bury their head in the sand and it just, oh my goodness. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to accept the reality of, of aging. And, you know, uh, we live in a, a, a world where youth, <laughs> youth seems to be, but um, it, it isn't, you know, aging is not an insult and youth isn't a compliment. So we're all, we're all moving ahead in different directions. So um, yes. You know, so and hopefully we stay healthy. That's the most important thing. So I want to thank you, Carol, for a wonderful presentation. I think we're gonna you're gonna get lots of orders for your book. I recommend it. It's a wonderful book. I've so enjoyed meeting oh, you, thank you, interacting thank you, with you. Um, a little uh, reminder for those that are listening: on November eighth, we are doing a podcast on how to sell your house in the off season and that's going to be at one o'clock so check our website register for that uh the housing market continues to change so that will be worthwhile too so wishing you uh, a wonderful fall in texas and holiday season carol and thank you look forward to connecting with you again in the future oh thank you and i'm so sorry i forgot to keep that slide up that's My okay apologies. that's all right it's okay it's okay we took care of everything it was all good so stay well and thanks so much. And thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, yes, that's right. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us. So any yes. questions, Carol's available, I'm available, reach out. We're here for okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.